Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I'm reading Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, and you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord, let him deliver, let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb, you kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver from my soul, deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus knowing all that was going to happen to him went out and asked them who is it you want 
Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good for one, if one man died for the people. The Bible doesn't tell us much about Judas. What we do know is Judas was one of the original 12 disciples. He left a life behind to follow Jesus. He may have had a lucrative career. He may have left a pregnant wife or teenagers or elderly parents behind to follow Jesus. We know that like most all the disciples, he sacrificed. He made a personal sacrifice to follow Jesus. He made that sacrifice to get to know Jesus intimately. He witnessed the miracles. He slept where Jesus slept. He ate from the same table and heard the parables firsthand. Jesus loved him, just like he loved all the other disciples. He invested in Judas. He shared the revelations of the kingdom of heaven with him. He was preparing him to spread the gospel. Judas was his friend. The suffering didn't begin with the arrest. It began with the betrayal. The suffering didn't begin with bound hands. It began with a broken heart.
reading from the 18th chapter of the book called John. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. And the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. And the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Judeans come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? And Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Peter, you were and are such an incredible figure. You're the consummate study in contrasts. You show us the height of faith and the depth, the depth of faithlessness. You walk on water and then you sink like a stone. You proclaim Jesus as the Messiah and are named the rock on which the church will be built. You rebuke Jesus, and he rebukes right back by calling you Satan, the deceiver, a stumbling block to the mission of God. You promise that you will follow Jesus all the way to your own death, only to express that you don't know this man. Three times as he's being dragged away, locked up, beaten, and killed. Peter. You are each of these things at one time or another, and you are all of these things at the same time. Peter, you are so incredibly fragile and strong, fickle and determined, sheepish and bold. Peter, you are so much like us. Our faith is your faith. There are times when we are certain willing to stake a hundred of our lives on it. There are also times when I don't know the man rolls off of our tongues as easily as it did yours. There are times when we walk on water, when we stand on the mountaintop, when we are the solid rock, just as there are times when we sink and we stumble through the valley and when we are a stumbling block to everything that passes our way. Peter, you weren't chosen to be the rock on which the church is built for your constancy or because of your unheard of faith or because of your wisdom, you were called the rock even as you were a stumbling block because Jesus saw God's presence in you. God revealed those words to you that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. Those words could only come from God. Nothing else that Jesus had shown or would show would amount to that conclusion, miracle.
spirits, healings, and words notwithstanding, others had and would do those things as well. Peter, you were called off of your fishing boat because you look and sound and think and feel so much like each one of us. Of course you have your faults then, Peter. We all do. Your expectations of what the Messiah should and could and must be were incorrect. Your hope had to be dashed so that God could show God's true self to you. Your heart had to be broken so that God could show you a new heart, one that looks past the picture of a crucified Jesus to a risen Messiah. Oh, oh the surprise you would have as you see the risen Jesus in the words that you're going to speak to the crowds as the church is raised up. Peter, Christ has showed himself through you. Christ has showed us more about ourselves through you. Our hearts will be broken. Our hopes will be dashed. Our fears will often overcome our joys. We will hear the words that Christ is the Messiah and know in our hearts that nothing is more true. And then we too will stumble and say, I do not know the man. We will catch a glimpse of God only to lose it before we can commit it to memory and faith. But God can work with that. God has always been able to work with that. God revealed God's self to you, Peter. The great stumbling block the blockhead who sank on the water and the rock on which Christ builds his church. This, Peter, is God's grace and God's will in the world. On rocks like you, Peter, the church is built. On rocks like us, Peter, the church is built. Our journey as we walk with Christ will be filled with stumbling blocks, often the stumbling blocks of our very own selves. But you of great faith, Peter, we of great faith, always walk with a God and a Messiah who are willing to work, even through stones like us. Amen. Tremble, tremble.
A reading from the 18th chapter of St. John, beginning at the 28th verse. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Here ends the reading. Accused. In 1993, Anthony Wright narrowly escaped the death penalty by a 7-5 to jury vote for fatal crimes against an elderly woman he did not commit. It has taken 25 years, several DNA tests, a conviction reversal, retrial, and the tireless work of the Innocence Project senior staff and many others to exonerate Wright. The jury took less than an hour to find Wright innocent after a retrial in which lawyers presented overwhelming scientific evidence demonstrating Wright's innocence and pointing to the true assailant. Sonia Sonny Jacobs, age 64, was sentenced to death at the age of 28 for the murder of two police officers in Florida. Jacobs was exonerated with the help of the Center for Wrongful Convictions in 1992 after spending 17 years in prison, a number of them on death row. Her story, along with those of five other wrongfully convicted death row inmates, was featured in the play The Exonerated. In 2001, she married Peter Pringle from Ireland, who also survived death row for a crime he did not commit. Accused. It is perhaps six o'clock in the morning. The top of the temple is beginning to pick up the first light of a new day, and it shines out of, the, out of night as a new day is dawning. The valley below the Dead Sea remains dead, in darkness because night passes more slowly in the valley. The narrow city straits remain dark too. However, if you listen closely, you would hear footsteps. People are beginning to move. On one dark street, there is a knock at a door. Someone answers and receives a whispered message. They have taken the Nazarene. He was condemned last night by the Sanhedrin. Perhaps this will be the day that we will see his mighty power arise to destroy Rome. With that first one, then two, three, four, and soon a small trickle of people to stream out into a fast flowing river of humanity that begins to pour from the Passover packed city to the palace where Pontius Pilate meets out Roman justice. Inside that palace is one unhappy man Pilate is likely none too pleased to be awakened in the middle of the night to deal with what he considers essentially a Jewish problem. Yes, Jews. Pilate's hatred for the Jews is legendary and is matched only by their hatred for him. Gruffly, why Pilate steps out and asks the Jews a question. What accusation do you bring against this man? In their best ecclesiastical voices, why they answer, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Then Pilate responds, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews reply, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. It surely broke Jesus' heart to have Pilate press the matter, that it was his own people, the Jews, who had accused him and brought him to this place. Does anyone hear? Know the pain of betrayal by someone you thought should be loyal to you? Imagine the hurt that you feel when the people who were supposed to have your back ditch you, or even worse, rather than having your back, they are the ones who place the dagger in your back? Accusations, rightfully or wrongfully, sting. Yet Jesus does not respond with recriminations. This night, Jesus is worthy of our adoration because of his willingness to identify with the human condition. 
John says it all in the prologue to his gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. What an amazing truth. Jesus became one of us. This night, Jesus is worthy of our adoration because of his compassion for everyone he meets on his time on earth. It made no difference who they were or how much or how little they deserved it. it he looked at people through very special eyes, the eyes of love and compassion. This night, Jesus is worthy of our adoration because of his willingness to go to the cross. See from his head, his hands, his feet, wrote Isaac Watts, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? On one occasion, Jesus himself summed it up. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Might we be accused of such love?
This is Pastor Omar. This is Diana and Bruno. From San, San Andres. Andres. We want to share with you a reflection about the trial before Pilate. Jesus has been condemned by religious authority. The Sanhedrin has gathered at night and called on all its members to conduct a summary trial without witnesses and covered by darkness. The next day, Jesus is delivered into Pilate's hands in broad daylight. Pilate will be the one who ratifies the judgment of the Jewish authorities. For Pilate, it was simply a matter of maintaining order in the face of a domestic lawsuit, but this would bring political consequences. The important thing is that when we, he is condemned, Jesus is stripped of his rights as a citizen of the Jewish people. He is banished from his community, excluded from community life, expelled from communion with others. The night trial has left him alone. They have wanted to leave him without a temple, without God, without the possibility of meeting him. They have banished him from his own home. They wanted to break Jesus from inside. They have sought that to take away his dignity. Often, we think that in all this process, only the bad guys in the film stand out. However, in that trial, we all took part, the Jewish and their sectarian parties, Pharisees, Sadducees, the authorities of the temple and the Sanhedrin, Pilate and the Roman army, the confused and angry people led by abusive leaders, Jesus' disciples who gave him and denied him, and us. When Jesus and his demands are heavy and annoying, we achieve what they achieve, to leave him out of our lives, out, out of our worship, and out of our world. Jesus is judged. Truly community is an essential part of our daily life, not only among ourselves, but also in our relationship with nature, with every living being. The harmony we are seeking is that of being able to live together with the freedom of having an individuality. And the ideal of dignity for all living forms, including our own life. Talking about human authority, disposition and exile, what are the options? That is the challenge that we all face today. In the midst of a community or society that we had created together, full of social, religious, and governmental codes, where the classification system includes some and discards others, nature itself has forces us to stop and to reevaluate. Throughout the Gospels, the voice of Jesus is heard as an echo, inviting us to cling and strain our relationship with God and not with fear. This relationship with God always leads us to include and to be included as an essential part of one body, as part of the same creation. Today, we experience being part of a universal community united by a pandemic, which pushes us to reassess from the privacy of our homes what is truly essential, to recover those relationships that we had a little neglected and to make use of one of the biggest fruits of human brain, the technology, to dissolve distances and borders instead of separating us. On the other hand, we find ourselves succumbing to fear and despair, reacting in many different ways, sometimes in total denial, putting our needs and desires before others and putting them at risk abandoning our pets because we fear famine or contagion, and monopolizing everything within our reach to create a fragile sensation of safety. Those are all symptoms of a society that cries out loud for a Messiah, the one who we already have among us, the one that we share in communion, and most important, the one who did not leave us alone, 
he left his spirit, the spirit of consolation. But yet we do not recognize it, blinded by the fear of all those things that we have created. The options are clear. Do we need to condemn each other to death, or do we use our time to create ways to re-belong to the community of creation? When Jesus wept the falling tear, in mercy flowed beyond all bound. When Jesus So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. thirties. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. 
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received that wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. As John narrates the hours Jesus spent on the cross, we learn that several women have shown up. Jesus' mother Mary, Mary's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Though many abandoned Jesus when he needed them most, just as he predicted, we find it is the women who stand firm and keep vigil. Instead of standing away, afraid to bear witness to Jesus' pain and torture, the women stand close, as close as they can get to the base of the cross. Close enough so Jesus, with his parched lips and his raspy voice and fleeting breaths, is able to relay a message to Mary, his mother. Woman, here is your son. A message that seems odd. I found myself asking, why didn't he say mother? Why didn't he address Mary by her name, Mary? Why so cordial and distant? Everyone leans forward, not wanting to miss anything, and they hear Jesus address the disciple standing next to Mary. Here is your mother. These two sentences though short and unsuspecting, tell a much deeper story. In his last moments, Jesus uses one more opportunity to express the importance of relatedness. By inviting his mother and beloved disciple into a mutual relationship where they must both equally rely on each other for success, Jesus demonstrates one last time the magnitude of our connectedness through Christ. And by merging both his beloved disciple, who represents the community of followers, whose love and grace will continue past the gospel story we read today, and his mother, who represents the first of Jesus, a representation of the incarnation, a witnesses to Jesus' first miracle, a symbol and reminder of Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus is creating a larger moment than we might realize. In his last moments and breaths, Jesus connects his past, his mother Mary, and the future, his beloved disciple, to demonstrate the relationship of past and future. The fulfillment of scripture and the promise of continuation of grace and love through the disciples' continued ministry which then becomes our ministry. Knowing that his mother and future disciples are taken care of, Jesus has had enough. Jesus' pain was not only physical from his hands and feet bearing all of his weight, but he was in emotional pain from seeing his cause defeated. Spiritual pain from being abandoned by those who pledged their allegiance and loyalty and being betrayed by those who he just recently ate and drank with. Jesus' last request in the Gospel of John is for water. I am thirsty. A testament to the human nature of Christ, who, like many whose pain leads them to thirst, something that might offer a brief reprieve from the suffering. But this ask has deeper meaning. It's more symbolic. This request of water, of thirst, is an ever-present reminder and example of God's thirst, of God's thirst for righteousness, of God's thirst for justice of the marginalized, of God's thirst for every person to feel valued, understood, and cared for. Jesus' last request demonstrates a God who thirsts to be in relationship with us, 
a God who is now a fellow sufferer, a God who now accompanies the pain of every dying person. Upon receiving the sour wine, Jesus uses his last breath to declare, it is finished. He then bows his head and gives up his spirit. Tonight we pray for God's holy church in every land. Lord, your power is beyond our imagination, and yet you sent your son to us as a humble carpenter, riding into Jerusalem on a colt. By your Holy Spirit, guide your church to gather throughout the world, to share the good news of your grace in Jesus Christ with all people, and to serve our neighbors with kindness and humility. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Tonight we pray for all the servants of your church, for our bishops Elizabeth and Brian, for pastors, for those who have gathered in their homes to worship tonight, and those who could not join us online. Lord, your Holy Spirit guides our steps each day. Help each of us to do your work in the church and in the world as you have called us to, with generosity and open hearts, and keep us in health and safety. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Tonight we pray for all those who are preparing for baptism. Lord, you bless your church each day with your wisdom and grace. Give all those who are taking their first steps into faith insight into your understanding and compassion. As they receive their new life in Christ, give them community and communion within the church and bless them with a thriving and healthy community for support. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Tonight we pray for all of God's wondrous creation from the stars above us to the dirt beneath us, from gigantic galaxies to the tiniest atoms, from the smallest frog to the blue whale, from the centurion to the newborn. You care for all that you have created. Help us to care for it as you do and bring everything you've made to fulfill its purpose. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Tonight we pray for all who serve in public office, whether they are appointed by officials or elected by the people. Lord, your voice speaks on behalf of the weak and the downtrodden, those whose voices and needs are ignored. Give your wisdom to all those with power to use it so that all people may live in a world of justice and peace, sharing in your creation with generosity and compassion. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Tonight, we pray for those on the front lines during the ongoing pandemic, first responders, medical personnel, chaplains, nursing home workers, grocery store employees, truck drivers, National Guard members, and others who are keeping essential businesses running at risk to their own personal safety. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Tonight we pray for those in any kind of need. Lord, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to those who must travel for their jobs, free those unjustly imprisoned or oppressed, and deliver your world from dishonesty, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble and help them in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and he removed the body. Nicodemus, who had, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in the linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Every culture has a series of customs and rituals and practices that surround the experience of losing someone we've loved that are helpful to us and important to us as we try to comprehend the meaning of death and to deal with our grief and to find a way to get back to our life. This is the Fellowship Hall of St. Matthew Lutheran Church where one of the most important parts of our experience of grief happens. It is the lunch that takes place after the funeral service, after the burial, after the prayers at the cemetery, after all of that is done, we come back to the hall and we have lunch together. It's a very important part of our process. It's an important time to encourage one another and comfort one another, and it can be helpful. But it also functions in a very different way. It is something to postpone what is inevitable. That is, at some point, the loved ones of the person who has died have to go home, often to an empty house, have to somehow find a way to continue their life with this emptiness, with this sadness, with this struggle that is grief. It's not our best thing to do, not our favorite thing to do. We have a tendency to want to make it go away quickly. It's a hard place to sit in the midst of grief. I wonder what it felt like for Jesus' followers. After the terrifying drama of the crucifixion, of, after all that came with that, after years of following him, after their deep-seated belief that he was their Savior, to come to this place, to lay his body in the tomb, and to have to walk away, and to wonder what will they do next. It's an experience that all of us either have had or will have. It is a question we are all asked to confront at some point in our life or another. Will we sit in a place of grief? Can we live 
with the hardship and the suffering that is so much a part of our everyday life. And especially right now, in the year 2020, as we are mired in the most incredible tragedy of many lifetimes, what does it mean for us to be called to simply be in a place that is so hard to be? For a lot of us, Good Friday will pass unnoticed because we are in such a hurry to get to Easter and we will miss its most important lesson. That here is the story of a God who left his heavenly throne and came and walked among his mortal creation and there shared our greatest fears, our most tragic endings, our deepest sorrows, shared our pain, shared our death. And if God should be so willing to do that, should we not also follow Jesus' example and walk this road with him? For the sake of all of our neighbors now, who are mired in great suffering, for the sake of our own souls, and the sadness and the weight we feel in this time, should we not have the faith to follow Jesus and say with him, Father, I commend my life, my being, my soul, into your hands. The greatest tool we have in grief is our trust. Our trust in the gracious compassion of God. Our trust that he knows this place where we are because he has been there before. As Jesus entrusted himself to the will of the Father, let us on this Good Friday entrust all that we have, all the places where we go, our entire world now, into his loving care. Let us not miss this moment to grieve. Let us go in the place where we must be, and God will bless us and find us in that darkness and in our tears and sit with us there too.